Yeah. yeah. What, what about the, what about the prospects of breeding uh, cannabis plants for resistance or tolerance to say some of the common pests like thrips and, and mites? Um, so, as I told you earlier, um, cannabis is is really gap bridging now a gap of thirty years of of well illegal research. So we hadn't. There's a huge gap in technology. So now we're jumping directly into, into breeding and into m- gapping those 30 years. And a lot of the things that are so-called low-hanging fruits in other crops, like resistances, are just not there. So there needs to be people like you in, in, the, in, the, in the pest management world coming up with germplasm that's tested. We need a more um, phenotyping systems. We need to isolate the genes. We do the part where we find a gene, but we need germplasm. Like we talked about earlier, we need the germplasm and we need a scoring system. A lot of times I talk to uh, companies that do breeding and they say, okay, how do we score our resistance? And we don't do that. We need collaboration with the pest management people. And that, that would be a good tie-in because you know, there's been studies in entomology for many years that um, we call host plant resistance or tolerance uh, and biocontrol can work hand in hand or conjunction. Having plants that are resistant, um, that could be in, used in combination with the biologicals like predators and parasitoids to um, enhance the, the reduction or suppression of pests on a plant like cannabis. There are... Um these could be physical stuff. These could be a better performance of the plant in, in a very mixed system where you have total pest management. Um, it could be hairs on the leaves that prevent the, the, the trees trichomes, from sticking. Yeah. It, not necessarily trichomes. It could be hairy varieties like you have in tomatoes. Pubescence. We need, yeah, yeah. we need those sources. We need uh, people who have collected germplasm, exotic germplasm, and uh, if it's a problem, we need to breed for it. So it, it calls for collaborations of institutions, companies like myself and like yourself, um, to work together and, and generate um, new germplasm that's resistant. There won't be that much need for pesticides. Everybody's going to be happy with that. Right, and, and to me, the the crop in question is strictly 100% biological because there's no need to spray when you're worried about residue issues. And, you know, we, we have the biological control agents for each of those given pests, uh, but if, we, if there's an idea or methodology where we can have plants that are more tolerant of the pest, whether it be through chemical nature, physical nature, that might enhance the efficacy of the bio, biological control agents. What were the key take-home messages from your presentation earlier today? Yeah, the, the key points that I wanted to get across was uh, for identifying the insect and mite pest you're dealing with, and that will allow you to select the appropriate biologic control agents. And then the other part was the quality control aspect. You know, when you get material from your supplier, be sure it's alive and functional before you make your releases, because that's going to ensure the success of the biocontrol agents on the specific pests in your crop. I know, I know one of the uh, a major concern coming up is the, the root aphids. The root aphids, I've been getting calls, uh, inquiries regarding that, and one of my suggestions is the use of Delosia coriara, which is the row beetle. Uh, that might, it's a generalist predator, so that so I'm, that would be something if you're trying to deal with road aphids, you have road aphids in your operation, then I would contact the suppliers and try to start using the road beetle Delosia coriara and see how it does. I, I, th- I think overall the, the key pests are thrips, uh, mites, and that includes areified mites and broad mites and russet mites. Those are, pretty, those are pretty consistent across the country because everybody's growing the, the same crop. So it's really hard for me to say that in Washington, they're having an outbreak of this, and in Maine, they're having an outbreak of something else. I actually can comment on that because I have a broader perspective, I think, on the industry because we're working with 
with companies in Europe and in Canada. So Canada has a lot of fungal diseases, but there is also reports now of um, viral diseases being propagated or uh, dispersed through uh, insect agents. They're not truly identified yet, but there's talk of three viruses that are probably spread by aphids. And um, I've heard it's, it's a rumor right now of crops grown outdoors in the hemp space in Oregon where a mysterious disease, they don't even know what it is, wipes out entire crops and spreading from south to north Oregon. So it could be just rumors now, but these things happen. And as breeders and cultivators, we must be prepared. We must have an, a germplasm collection and means to characterize and to breed fast for um, to fight back uh, with whatever strikes our crops. I think an important message also is that, you know, in the greenhouse you have a certain uh, uh, types of or multiple complex, but when you grow outdoors, then you're susceptible to other types of insects. Uh, that includes vectors like leafhoppers and psyllids and ca caterpillars and, other, and, and actually beetles more so in the greenhouse. So when you grow outdoors, uh, you're getting, a, uh, I would say, a plethora of different types of insects or your complex is different than it might be in a greenhouse.